Tetsuo the Iron Man and 964 Pinocchio were underground hits, with Tetsuo even breaking out overseas. But in spite of this, few directors seemed willing to pick up where Tsukamoto and Fukui were leaving off. Japanese cyberpunk demanded total commitment from its practitioners, and as it turned out, not many were capable of meeting those demands. Not even Tsukamoto and Fukui had the stamina to do it more than once. The movies were sort of like punk rock, an explosion of anger and coiled emotion. The purity of that explosion, once it was released, left nowhere to go. The directors could only move on. Tsukamoto parlayed the success of Tetsuo into a distinguished career. Today, he stands as one of the few totally uncompromised and totally independent filmmakers in Japan, his work still fearlessly treading into uncharted terrain. He did film two sequels to Tetsuo, Tetsuo 2 Body Hammer in 1992 and Tetsuo the Bullet Man in 2010, his first film in English. But these sequels are more like reimaginings of the same story in alternate styles. Both are impressive achievements, unfairly maligned, I think, for the nonsensical reason that they aren't exactly like the original. Of course they aren't. They're different. And those differences showcase Tsukamoto's growth as a filmmaker, his development as a person, as age and maturity motivate him to see the world in different ways, and give voice to different concerns. Whether we like it or not, life is always moving forward, and art must move with it. Fukui seemed to consciously sense the limitations inherent in a form as extreme as Japanese cyberpunk, saying later that he tried to make his second film, Rubber's Lover, in a way that excluded a cyberpunk element. He shot it in black and white, and adopted a more minimalist approach, one that still strove for a radical level of intensity. Fukui allowed no speaking on set beyond the most basic instructions, and hoped to create a tone unlike any yet achieved in film. It was utterly draining for all involved, and Fukui basically retired following its completion. He now runs a bar in Tokyo, and occasionally releases new short films, none of which have found distribution outside Japan. Rubber's Lover, a rare, difficult-to-see artifact, which I actually haven't managed to view for myself, has attracted a reputation as an exceptionally disturbing film. Some call it cyberpunk, some call it a full-on splatter film, and this is interesting because these two subgenre would become increasingly mixed as time went on. Eventually, Japanese cyberpunk would give way to splatterpunk, a movement of far less thematic depth, but beloved by fans for its imaginative abundance of blood and gore. I do like some of these movies, and a few, like Meatball Machine, contain a similar deranged feeling of invention, comparable to the great cyberpunk works. One movie in particular stands out. Released the same year as Rubber's Lover, Kei Fujiwara's Organ is probably the most neglected entry in the splatterpunk, nay cyberpunk pantheon. Fujiwara was closely tied with Shinya Tsukamoto, she was an original member of the Kaiju Theater, played major roles behind and in front of the camera for Tsukamoto's early work, and was instrumental in the completion of Tetsuo, assisting with effects, cinematography, and playing the crucial part of the salaryman's girlfriend. Tetsuo's production difficulties brought an end to their working relationship. Fujiwara next started an experimental theater troupe of her own, and much like Tsukamoto, arranged the script for Organ based off one of their stage pieces. Fujiwara was just about the only woman closely associated with the movement, and she had her own approach to its world. Organ marks a clear 
and dramatic departure from the established mold. Revolving around a ruthless organ harvesting syndicate, Fujiwara avoids the narrative minimalism of her predecessors by spinning several parallel story threads. In one, we find a disgraced cop determined to track the harvesters down. In another, a second cop is searching for his kidnapped brother, who has become a victim of the gang's twisted medical experiments. And in the third, we find the sadistic brother and sister running the whole operation, both scarred by childhood trauma and determined to survive. Fujiwara's storytelling is less frantic and a little more articulate than Tsukamoto's or Fukui's. She puts more emphasis on character, she conveys more emotional weight, and her plot contains a higher degree of observable cause and effect. This does not, however, make Organ a more accessible film. Much is still left unexplained. Scene arrangement is sometimes jumbled, chronology is not always clear, and Fujiwara's imagery is very explicit, at times repulsive, but she seems to have more intent behind it than merely nauseating her audience. Fujiwara explained the ambition of Organ as describing the agony of a wounded soul, portraying people who were decaying inside. Her characters all feel haunted, desperate, guilt-ridden. Their strangely deformed bodies serve as symbols for the psychological rot taking hold of them. Fujiwara seems to be contemplating the nature of cruelty asking where this evil finds its foundation, what consequences result in the committing of unspeakable acts, and what horrible sickness those capable of committing them have to carry around inside. Prior cyberpunk directors bludgeon the audience with their ideas. Fujiwara broods over them. The connection to the cyberpunk tradition is not always conspicuous, but Fujiwara's hallucinatory stream of imagery, her lingering shots of bodily mutations and mutilations, feel at least like an appropriation. One especially unsettling moment has a character suddenly and inexplicably envisioning a woman hatching from a giant chrysalis. This image would be right at home in a movie like Death Powder or 964 Pinocchio the genre was shifting into a new gear. The splatterpunk films would adopt the basic tools and vocabulary of cyberpunk, but Fujiwara was arguably the last director who used them to voice serious thematic concerns. Fujiwara started filming a sequel to Oregon at some point, but it was never finished. Apparently she wound up incorporating the footage into her 2005 film, Id, an experimental thriller, and after that, she appears to have abandoned film for the theater. She has been reported to still be producing theater pieces near her home in the remote mountain region of Nagano. The funny thing about genre is that it never happens deliberately. Nobody sets out to create a specific blueprint for something original. Originality is created through chance and experimentation, guided by the artist's need to communicate idea and emotion. It's only after the fact that a pattern emerges. Outside splatterpunk, cyberpunk is now an established genre of the mainstream. Following a box office success like The Matrix, most of its days of experimentation are over. This is not to say that once something becomes popular, it loses all vitality. There are still interesting things being done with cyberpunk motifs. The Wachowski sisters' often misunderstood Matrix films are a more than worthy addition to the canon, and when you consider the genre's engagement with identity as it relates to the body, the films gain a deeper level of profundity by the fact that they were created by two trans women. But the passing of a movement from the fringes of the avant-garde 
to the marketing rooms of the industry, does signal a kind of end. Aesthetics are engineered into formula, themes pass into shorthand, and meaningful art must begin to compete with commercial product. It's the nature of the industry, imperfect but inevitable. So that makes it essential for us to continue engaging with our art in a serious way. More than autonomy or industry affirmation, art needs a curious and receptive audience in order to thrive. The way we engage with it makes a difference. The brief moment of Japanese cyberpunk's lifespan appears to have passed, but its mad energy and delirious thrills live on. If it inspires something, I hope what it inspires is not the pilfering of its surface extremity and unorthodox technique, but an expansion of possibilities. When we look to this movement, we should be reminded of what can happen when artists dare to throw caution to the wind and create according to their deepest instincts. That doesn't mean it has to take this form, but one form can galvanize another, help lead artists in their own direction, their own search for what they have to say and how they need to say it. You never know what might be out there waiting for discovery until you take a chance and try looking for it.